this challenge. So we uh, have designed um, three rovers so far. Uh, each year we go to Alabama, um, Huntsville, Alabama, uh, where the Marshall Space Flight Center is located to compete with uh, around 100 national and international teams um, annually for this uh, competition. And the team has been, uh, the rover team at UDC has been doing extremely well uh, for the past few years. Uh, they design and build uh, the human power rover, um, you know, uh, during the, their uh, spare time and uh, uh, to compete uh, with other uh, teams. And everything from scratch, they have to design, um, build, and test. Um, so this project is to look at how we can utilize uh, advanced manufacturing technique to produce this lattice structure, uh, which is um, found to have similar mechanical strengths but greatly reduced weight. Uh, so we were, uh, because weight is one of the critical design consideration in the rover, so the team is trying to utilize this technique as a special structure uh, to modify some of the parts they use in their rover design to uh, reduce the weight while maintaining the uh, mechanical strength they need. So with that, I will turn over to the team and have them present their project. And again, um, please hold your question to the end, uh, but feel free to type in the chat box anytime. And also, uh, don't forget, uh, fill out the survey form and select the right project when you do that. And um, so are you ready, Giancarlo? Uh, yeah, I think we're all set. Okay, all right, you can start at any time. Okay, so our project is, um, as Dr. Xu introduced, uh, the design, manufacturing, and characterization of additively manufactured lattice structures for the NASA Human Exploration Rover Challenge. Um, I'm Giancarlo, and I'm joined here by James and Waleed, and you can see some of our uh, product that uh, we uh, made using these design principles. So uh, just to give you a uh, brief outline um, as to what we're going to be doing. Uh, so we'll explain a little bit about what the NASA Human uh, Exploration Rover Challenge is and the design problem around that. Uh, some of our lattice structure research, uh, the design and analysis of these structures, um, fabrication, mechanical testing, post-processing, uh, the conclusions we've drawn from that work, and uh, future work and acknowledgements. So just to give a little bit of background, the NASA Human Exploration Rover Challenge um, is a NASA competition which takes place in Huntsville, Alabama. Um, it's an international competition involving approximately 100 participants, uh, 50 high schools and 50 universities. And participating teams must develop a human-powered rover uh, which can navigate a uh, course of simulated lunar and Martian terrain and complete various challenges. Uh, the teams are competing for points uh, so they are competing on the basis of uh, completion time as well as challenges completed. And uh, really the main takeaway is this rewards a robust design uh, that can complete the course in the allotted time. Um, so it encourages the teams to think about the development of technology and uh, you know, design thinking for aerospace applications. Um, unfortunately, as with everything, the 2020 challenge was canceled due to the pandemic, uh, but we still got a fair amount of work done. So as the uh, rover is being built, uh, weight is a major concern. Um, the more weight we add to the rover uh, is just incurring a penalty because the rider is producing the same amount of power uh, when they're pedaling. So parts of the rover, uh, such as, for instance, the steering knuckles, um, have to be very precisely manufactured, but they're also used multiple times on the rover, up to four times. Um, so if we reduce the steering knuckle by a pound, uh, we actually get a four pound reduction in overall weight which doesn't sound like a lot, but it really starts adding up um, when you have, say, a 195-pound rover or 150-pound rover. Um, so we took on the development of a new knuckle design. Please, me, please. Uh, thanks. Uh, we worked on development of a new knuckle design with emphasis on lightweight and high strength. Um, so looking at uh, some solutions for this, uh, metal foams and honeycombs and offer substantial benefits. Uh, so they have a high specific strength, um, but they are hard to manufacture, expensive, um, and you have to bond them to your parts, uh, either with adhesives, welding, or another process. Um, so that is a failure mode. 
uh, the additively manufactured uh, metals that we can okay. produce here in school, though, can incorporate lightweight lattice structures within a shelled solid all in one piece. Uh, so we can see up to a 50% re weight reduction without a large reduction in strength of the part. Um, so these lattice structures are defined by a uh, repeating unit cell structure, uh, which you can either have fill a void or outright replace a solid. Um, these hold great promise for aerospace applications. So again, the high specific strength is a huge benefit uh, where weight is a major concern. Uh, thermal isolation, so they're relatively um, small contact area due to the size of the, the lattice. And they can be used in heat exchange applications as well. Uh, but obviously these can't be created through traditional manufacturing. Uh, there's a lot of complex curves and angles. Uh, so really the way to make these is through an additive process. Um, so to that end, we're using a um, 3D metal printer, um, and that in, gives us some constraints. So there's volumetric constraint for one. Uh, the build platform is 250 by 250 by 325 millimeters um, in size. And uh, the powder is quite expensive, so there's a cost associated uh, with each part volume. Um, so we want to minimize our building uh, size as much as possible. Uh, there's a Z-height constraint. Uh, so the amount of powder on hand limits the amount of uh, build height that we have. So we have a little bit less than 100 millimeters total build height. Um, and uh, the printer itself is filled with the Meraging Steel Powder. Uh, it's easy to work with, print, and process. And it has really great mechanical properties, which we'll go into in a little bit more detail. Uh, so this is a uh, steering knuckle design. Uh, so we did weight reduction of the parts with simulation of the shell without the lattice structure. Um, we found about... 1.8, uh, 1.56 micron display, uh, displacement with uh, 1.8 kilonewtons of force on the knuckle. Um, so the shelled area you see there is going to be filled with the lattice structure, and that was determined through our experimental testing of the lattices. I'm going to hand you off to James. We'll go into more detail on the lattice. Thanks, John. Uh, so in order to create these lattice structures and implement them into our design, uh, we used uh, Creo 6.0, which is our actually the school's preferred uh, 3D modeling uh, system. Uh, we actually found that their lattice structuring uh, module was one of the more robust, which was great for us. So it, it was broken down in a, a few sections, the beams type structures, uh, which were sort of the first push lattice structures, the 2.5D, which are great for uh, uh, uniaxial strength, and then the formula driven, which is a, a new uh, set of uh, lattice structures that have been introduced in Creo 6.0. And so with our research, uh, we, we looked into uh, what data we could find about these lattice structures. So we actually found a really excellent article uh, where a team had tested uh, these these pretend lattice structures with meraging steel using the AOSint M280 uh, 3D printer, which is what we'll be using. So it was a great um, direction for us to uh, take our project. So it gave us stress strain curves for each structure, um, and then it gave the peak stress, plateau stress, toughness, and Young's modulus. Um, so we looked at the data that we were given. We get a comparison uh, graph here of the, the peak stress for uh, relative densities of each of the different uh, structures that they tested. Uh, we can see here we've highlighted the sheet diamond and, and the relative density of 10%. Uh, it's head and shoulders over the other structures. And then at 25%, it's, uh, it's not quite as uh, greatly over the other structures, but it's still significantly better. So we did a decision matrix uh, to decide which structure we wanted to use in order to move forward in our, our, in our project. So we took a couple of criteria based on what we had is plateau stress, Young's modulus, toughness, ultimate strength, and of course the availability of the lattice structure within the program we were using. So a few of them that were kind of stronger we weren't able to use, but uh, again, the, the sheet diamond uh, in terms of across the board strengths and availability we were able to use. Um, so that next slide yeah and then so that sort of changed the scope of our project uh, a little bit we we originally were going to use uh, different lattice structures and test them out but we actually decided we were going to go with different densities of the sheet diamond structure since we found it to be uh, much greater in our research um, than the other structures uh, you can see here we've got the uh, 
the uh, equation for the sheet diamond structure, uh, a lot of cosine and sine waves, so a very uh, curved structure. Um, and then, so what we decided to use is a data trend based uh, on the on densities and str uh, strength characteristics to decide uh, which density we would use for the final rover print. So here is a stress strain curve for differing uh, densities for the sheet diamond structure at uh, 25 percent, 20 percent, and 16 percent. Uh, you can see that for each, uh, it's about a 5% jump for each um, density. Uh, you get about a 25% gain uh, in the uh, peak stress um, and, and about the same in the, uh, in the strain area as well. So you get a lot of uh, gain even from, uh, even earlier we saw it between 10 and 25%, we, we saw a lot of st uh, strength gain. We still get it in between these, these different nominal notches. Uh, so we attempted to do some structural analysis. Uh, so we can see in the top left corner, we uh, it's a simplified rep of the lattice structure where we had tried to do shells on each side in order to apply physics loads uh, onto the structure. Uh, we found uh, we found a lot of trouble with it though. The 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 structure itself, even when you try to transfer it from PTC Creo uh, parametric to simulate, the the lattice structure doesn't propagate. Uh, so we found a few ways to get around that by transferring it to an STL file, back to an F, S, and to a step file, and then back into programs like ANSYS. And then you can see here on the bottom left is a, a mesh that we were able to get out of ANSYS, which uh, is not really defining the shape of what we're looking at because it's not including all of the, the empty space between the lattice. Um, and, and that was the best we were able to come up with. We actually found out that uh, many research organizations are, are not, are just doing experimental data because simulation is so complex. Um, I think with our program, we were able to do, uh, uh, we were able to do up to like 10,000 facets and this structure had over 600,000 facets. Um, so it was just a little too high for us and we had too many struggles with importing. So the equipment used, we use the our school supplied EOSN M280 DM direct metal laser centering printer. Uh, so it's a powder based printer with a 400 watt laser particle sizes of 50 to 60 microns. Um, so it's a it's a was a grant uh, that we got the machine at the school, so we got it up and running uh, with some MS1 Meraging steel this year, which is a great like high strength, large, low carbon uh, steel used in aerospace applications. And we use the MS1 powder that's made specifically for EOS by the EOS, uh, for the US printer. Um, so the materials that we needed in order, um, you can see a little video here of the, the process of the powder bed. Uh, the scraper uh, pushing the powder across the bed, and then the the the, uh, uh, the laser centering the uh, the structures together. Uh, pretty interesting. Um, so the supplies we needed were the meraging steel powder. We needed uh, a meraging steel build plates, and then nitrogen gas as the shield gas in order to uh, do the printing. Um, the other requirements were chem polishing uh, different acids, nitric, phosphoric, and hydrochloric, provided by Dr. Tiagi's nanotechnology lab. So here are just some quick properties of uh, the MS1 as printed. Um, I'm not going to go through them too much, but we can see at a, a you know a gigapascal or greater in tensile strength, and same with yield strength. That this is a very strong material. So printing and testing. So the initial samples were printed with a carbon fiber brush blade. Um, so there's three different blades you can potentially use for the system, a ceramic blade, a carbon fiber blade, and a high speed steel blade. So we had to you go with the carbon fiber brush blade because it's the best for, um, for high quality or complex prints as well. Uh, issues with using ceramic blade, which can potentially hit the um, we, we potentially hit the structure and break it, and then with the high-speed steel and the the MS1 is going to be uh, 
magnetic, so potential for the uh, the beads just attaching to the blade. Um, so we made uh, compressive test samples. Uh, in an example of ASTM E9, uh, we use misprinted tensile specimen samples for three-point beam loading, uh, and then uh, as well we are um, we have printed more uh, tensile tests for ASTM E8 standards. Um, and in the X, Y direction, and we'd like to test those. James. And I'll pass it off to Walid. Thank you. So, shown in both figures is our printed specimen that we printed to perform our mechanical testing on. Um, the left sample is the dog bone shaped specimen with the lattice structure that we printed for tensile testing. And on the right sample here is the uh, cylinder shaped specimen with lattice structure as well that we printed for our um, uh, compression testing. Um, the table shown here um, represents different types of densities um, for our printed samples. Um, we have uh, three different types of densities, 30%, uh, 40%, uh, and 50% um, <coughs> that, we test, that we tested. And uh, this um, is to help support the purpose of, the, of our project uh, in, in terms of weight reduction while uh, also maintaining the, our strength properties. <laughs> um, so we have here the 30% relative density sample carries a weight of 5.3 grams. Um, the 40% sample carries a weight of 6.4 grams. And the 50% shares a weight of 8 grams. Uh, shown here, the 30% actual weight was uh, from, uh, <laughs> from expected um, weight after printed. and. Uh, this is uh, due to excessive uh, residual powder uh, stuck on the part. And we also uh, turned the parts on the, uh, the left. So we might have been, um, we might have removed uneven uh, supported structures. So off to mechanical testing. Um, so understanding our printed samples, uh, mechanical properties, um, compression test, bending test, and tentile test, are the tests we prepared um, our, our printed specimen for, and to roughly um, follow the uh, American uh, Society for Testing and uh, uh, Material Standards. So unfortunately, because of our lattice structure printed design, um, the test pieces are not solid per these ACM testing guidelines. And um, shown on the top figure is the mechanical testing machine that we used, and um, it is called the Admit Expert 2600. It is located on campus uh, in Building 42. Um, the bottom figure shows the setup of our compression test. As you can see, our compression um, specimen is installed under the inline fixture. Um, although this uh, fixture here is uh, for a bending fixture, and uh, a platinum fixture would be more recommended uh, for this compression test. Uh, um, but uh, we used uh, the tools that were available at the time to delay, uh, to minimize delays and costs. Um, uh, plans to conduct the tensile testing, uh, but due to the spring pandemic, um, it was, uh, the work for it was paused. So the next slide here is the compression test and a video. And we had several, seven specimens in total for our compression, uh, three in 30%, two in 40%, and two in 50%. The, um, the test speed was run at five millimeters per minute, and the force range was set to 20 kilonewtons. So the result is a linear graph um, representing our best curves uh, from all samples. And uh, we have the stress versus strain, comparing the different types of three densities. The table on the right is viewing the ultimate, uh, sorry, the peak stresses that each density could withhold during the compression test. So uh, we look uh, at the graph. Uh, we are looking at the highest point before the line starts to fall and decrease. Um, where the, um, here we have the 30% uh, relative density falls at 158 megapascals. 40% at 211 megapascals, and the 50% at 188 megapascals. Um, these results appear to be inconsistent with expected. Um, 
due to the 40% appears significantly stronger than the 50%. And um, this demonstrates to the team that need for additional testing, as flaws may be due to printing or lack of post-processing. So this next test is our three-point point, uh, bending test. And um, we have three specimens of each. Apologize, it seems like PowerPoint crashed. <laughs> um, let me reopen. Um, so, again, um, we had three uh, specimens of each. We had the 30% uh, relative density and 40% relative density, but um, unfortunately the 50% relative density were lost due to technical difficulties uh, with the machine. So, the, the samples uh, were mostly the same with only um, one of 30% uh, samples showing a major defect that reduced the um, flexural uh, strength of the specimen. Um, the data shows the, the flexural strength is 168 megapascals for 30% density and uh, 248 megapascals for 40% density. Um, this shows us an increase of about 40% in flexural strength, um, even without the third point um, from the 50%. And um, the yield strength here shows that it's for the 30% growing being 110 megapascals, and uh, for the 40 percent, um, equals 133 megapascals. <coughs> so um, again, here um, we are just comparing the two different densities. Um, this time, we're adding um, information on the solid density, um, the data from the manufacturer specs uh, on the material that we shared. And then a previous slide from mechanical testing properties, mechanical properties, sorry. Um, and due to uh, no available flexural data, we are making comparison to the manufacturer's specifications for tensile properties um, for as printed parts. Um, although we cannot confirm the properties are the same, we cannot assume the specimen failed intention from the flexural test for data comparison. So our main takeaway from this is that the lattice uh, structure generally underperformed compared to as printed solid parts specifications in result to bending. And I would like to pass uh, the next to my colleague Giancarlo. Okay, thank you Ali. Uh, so I'm going to go a little bit over the, some of the post-processing and the work that we've done on the pieces here. Um, so all of these printed pieces uh, have some unwanted uh, steel granules that stick to them during the printing process. Um, and these affect the surface roughness and eventual accuracy of the parts to some degree. Uh, the surface also may contain cracks, which can decrease the strength of the part. <clears throat> so we used uh, cam polishing to remove these. Uh, we did SEM imagery taken uh, before we did any of the processing. Um, and then we used a chem polish procedure developed at UDC to remove this unwanted material and cracks. And then we compared the surface roughness uh, before and after the chem polish. Uh, so you can see on the platen there is our part in the SEM. And this is a 205 times magnification of the part, so you can see a large number of granules all over the surface of the uh, compressive test part that we have here. And zooming in a little bit more at about 1,000 times magnification, uh, you can see we have a lot of particulate between uh, about 5 and <clears throat> 30 microns in diameter, um, and this was pretty uniform over the entire surface of the part. Uh, so this chem polishing procedure uh, is using an acid bath uh, to remove these particulates. Um, and so the preliminary chem polish shows a massive improvement in surface finish. Um, we had a huge reduction in particles, um, almost none that we could see uh, in the 5 to 30 micron range, um, and fewer surface cracks. Uh, and we would expect that we could see a measurable increase in yield stress. Uh, this is something that we didn't have an opportunity to test. Um, but you can see to the right there is a chem polish uh, sample at 1,000 times magnification. And taking that, we can look at it 2,000 and 10,000 times on the left and right, respectively. And you can see the surface is incredibly uniform and smooth. Uh, we don't have any of this particulate that we uh, saw in the uh, pre-polished samples. 
Uh, so from there, we were taking our data uh, to design and print our steering knuckles. Uh, so they've been printed, not yet tested. In fact, they're still on the build plate exactly as they look right now. Uh, we used a relatively dense lattice structure at 45% relative density, uh, so kind of cutting the middle between uh, two upper ends. Uh, we had a really large reduction in mass compared to our previous Rover's knuckle, steering knuckle design. Uh, so at 380 grams, we had a 90% reduction in weight. Um, and uh, we still need to remove these from the build plate, uh, conduct uh, milling to clean the face of the part, um, and then chem polishing to remove the metal particulate, particularly in the lattice structure itself. Um, so we found that our prints are very close to the expected density um, according to the manufacturer's specifications. Uh, so a little more than 99% solid, which is pretty good for a uh, powder bed printer. Um, our bending test showed that our samples were fracturing before the expected for relative densities. Um, so that is a bit of a concern as far as that um, property. Uh, our compression tests were a bit inconclusive, uh, especially since the 40 and 50% relative density uh, the tests were seem to be flopped from uh, flipped from what you'd expect. So uh, that may be an artifact of using the brush blade during printing or some other flaw in the print. Um, and the chem polishing procedure was very successful in removing particulate and surface cracks from the samples. Uh, so we had a huge reduction in that surface particulate. So for our future work, um, you know, due to the stay-at-home orders, we weren't able to complete the rover. As you can see in that picture, it's quite unfinished um, and the upholstery looks terrible. Uh, so we would have liked to complete some more work. Uh, the tensile stress test articles, um, as we mentioned previously, our first set of tensile specimens uh, didn't complete uh, properly. We ran out of powder actually during the print. Uh, so we printed a new batch, which need to be tested still. Uh, we need to do part integration of the steering knuckle and road testing. Uh, we would also like to do additional SEM work and uh, chem polish testing. So testing the samples that have been chem polished versus the ones that have. And uh, we also have some other kind of further along the line, um, characterizing the heat effects of the printing, um, heat effect simulation and materialized magics. So that's the software we use to actually make these prints uh, slice for the printer. Um, you can see in that picture to the right, there's some bluish discoloration at the top of the part, and that's due to the uneven heating during printing. Uh, we also didn't conduct any heat treating of the parts, so there's still a large amount of internal stress in the parts, which could also contribute to premature bending and cracking. Um, and we didn't conduct the martensitic aging process, so that would uh, actually almost double the strength of our parts. And finally, uh, more thorough surface characterization with Kean's optical microscope, which the school just got. Um, and that would allow us to really make good uh, comparisons of the surface roughness uh, between the polished and unpolished parts. So here are a few of our primary references. Um, you know, we drew heavily on these in the uh, literature review and characterization of our lattice structures initially. And uh, finally, we would also like to thank um, our advisor, Dr. Hsu, um, to Kelly, our TA in the capstone course. Uh, we were supported by the uh, CAMSTAR uh, grant here at EDC. And we were helped along with by Dr. Klein, Dr. Tiagi, uh, Mr. Pablo Sanchez, uh, Josh Dillard actually was responsible for doing our chem polishing, and uh, we are also rovers funded in part by the DC Space Grant Consortium. All right, that's it. All right, very good. Um, so, yes, so now we can uh, start the question session. Um, I already see some questions here. So this question is from an advisory board member. So we were trying to ask, have you tried to validate your uh, simulation results against the uh, results you found in the literature? So we, we weren't able to get lattice simulation results. Uh, we, we found that our actual mechanical testing was in line with our literature, um, but uh, we, we worked tirelessly for several months using different programs to try to do the lattice simulation, and, and we were unable to be successful. OK. Yeah. <clears throat> so as being a very challenging task, uh, uh, there's a, a group, uh, and NASA is also working on similar tasks, and they have been having uh, some difficulty uh, simulating the lattice structure as well. Um, so there is another question, how did you get the actual density measurement for your sample? Uh, so we used the manufacturer specifications and extrapolated what the 
weight of a solid would be for the geometry that we printed, and we did a comparison based on that. Yeah, just to expand on that, we used um, Creo um, to do the uh, mass and volume analysis. So we got the theoretical maximums from there, and then we're able to compare that. OK. <clears throat> Any other question from the audience? Uh, uh, there's one more question from Dr. Klein that are there other mechanical tests you would like to perform? Well, I guess, yeah, the, the tensile tests uh, were, would have been a really nice component to have added. Um, and um, yeah, I think uh, doing uh, some more compressive testing uh, with a different platen, um, I actually designed a um, adapter to go onto the machine to give us a flatter platen, which I think would have been um, yeah, more useful. Yeah, and fatigue testing as well. Um, <clears throat> I believe we're in the process of getting a fatigue tester. Um, so that would definitely be very helpful, I think, uh, long term to see how these parts hold up. OK. Uh, I see another. Another question, uh, what effect of improving surface roughness may occur on the mechanical, uh, especially the fatigue testing? You can check the... Sure, and I'll, I'll actually kind of pull up the slide here on this part for post-processing. Um, so uh, I think the biggest uh, result would be the removal of surface cracks and these uh, stress concentrations. Um, everywhere these little granules are touching, uh, they're pretty, forming an incredibly small radius of curvature where they're touching, so you have uh, more likely propagation of cracks through the surface. So hypothetically, a chem polished sample that's perfectly smooth, you're going to remove those failure points. Right, which would be especially critical for these lattice structures where any cracks can propagate very quickly. And uh, I guess for the just general question for this letter structure, um, you did mention uh, a few applications. So where did you see this can be applied uh, for a broader um, context, like a different aspect, maybe not just for NASA, but for some other areas? Where did you see this can be applied? Um, I know there's some applications in biomedical field uh, because you can create kind of um, artificial <clears throat> bone analogs uh, with some of these structures. Uh, if you're doing a bone replacement or something along those lines, I know that that's one area of interest um, outside of the aerospace industry. Okay. Uh, I guess maybe this is the last question. Uh, what's the most challenging aspect of your project? of what's your experience with it? Maybe each one of you can share a little bit. Okay, I guess I'll start it off, pass it to James and Waleed if we want to do it in that order. Sure. Um, so I think we, at least from my end, um, I think we had um, some significant time constraints in terms of getting the printer up and running. Um, so I was initially there for the printer training, um, and then our machine needed servicing, which gave us downtime, and then uh, we had to go back and do it. So it was a lot of, um, I, I think that, that time crunch was very difficult um, in terms of getting the parts printed, processed, and tested. Uh, it was very short turnaround time. So from, from my end, I think that was that was probably one of the hardest parts. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, the time constraints definitely, I mean, if we had another six months to a year to work on this project, uh, we could we could do a lot of things with it. And uh, and for me, especially, it was going to be working on the simulation results. I I tried several different programs. I tried to cheat the, the system in any way I could in order to, to get the lattice structure in there to be able to mesh it. But I just uh, wasn't unable to do it. And I will also touch on that as well with my teammates. Uh, time for this project uh, is an important aspect. Um, Especially like for mechanical testing, we'll, we'll gather more information on mechanical testing um, to provide uh, for our rover design. 
Yeah, I just want to mention that uh, advanced manufacturing is a very critical part of our curriculum. And so, as you see, we have in the four uh, ME capstone project, we have tried to infuse the advanced manufacturing into uh, those projects. So students can have experience on that. Uh, and also with the uh, metal 3 printer we have on campus, so really um, have the uh, students have the opportunity to learn this uh, very uh, advanced technique and also get trained um, uh, as an undergraduate student. It's very precious experience for them. So um, I saw Donna Thompson is here. So um, so I want to hand it over to her to introduce the BME group. So basically, um, we uh, 